Great. We are back again with uh, James sir and he's uh, sharing the amazing uh, Braha Sutras. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so uh, so I was saying, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please, please continue, sir. Uh, so I was saying uh, that, um, you know, I was having Lakshmi uh, read, you know, I wanted her to interpret what had been interpreted before. And I found that there were, there were things in there that I never heard before. And one of them was that uh, that I would be living at a dharmasthan, but not connected to it, which is, you know, I do, we do go to the temple occasionally. Whenever there's a yagya, we go. The fire ceremonies I love. But I don't go to the temple every night for arati. Uh, we go on Ganesha's birthday and things like that. But it was just very, very accurate. Um, Hold on one second here. Yeah, okay. Uh, so some other sutras that may help. Um, when clients, I don't know how much this happens in India, okay? But in America, it happens a lot. People say, I am pursuing moksha. I am pursuing enlightenment. Can I gain enlightenment? Yeah, yes. The answer to this question is, tell me your definition of moksha. Yes. If your definition of moksha is 100% bliss, no suffering at all, and mystical powers, you can say, no, you will not get that enlightenment. Even if you are wrong, you'll be wrong one out of about a billion cases. Yes. Because the only people that supposedly get that are the leaders of the movement. They have a movement. They tell them they're in bliss. They tell them they have no suffering and 10,000 people follow them, but nobody gets it. On the other hand, if they tell you that their definition of moksha is a full conviction that this is all maya, that it is not real, a true conviction of that, a true conviction that who I am is not the body, not the thoughts, not the feelings, who I am is the awareness or consciousness. Yes that is permanent. And if that conviction is complete, that person will not fear death. That person, when they die, when they die, there will be no lingering cravings and desires to bring them yeah, back. Yes, yes. But when you completely understand that there is no James Braha, there's only an appearance of a James Braha. Yes. When you understand that, where are the, where are the desires gonna come from? Yes. yes, I have a desire when this is over, I'll go get some ice cream or I'll go have a nice walk. There's a desire, but there's not the kind of desires that there used to be attachments. There used to be attachment. Those would bring you back to another life. Yes. When you understand there is no real Babajit, there's only an appearance of a Babajit, then you will not come back. So that's a very important thing. Um, and, 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 and just to tell you, before I even understood that, I could see from horoscopes, there is no essential difference between a very spiritual horoscope of a common person or the chart of Yogananda or Maharishi or Ramana Maharshi. You can see all those horoscopes. They are very spiritual, but there is nothing in there that screams, this person gains the ultimate. Is nothing in there. I've looked. Yes. Um, another thing about this is uh, another one of the sutras is about the retrograde planets. In the scriptures, it says that the retrograde planets are more powerful. That's what it, they give in the in the Shadbala, they give it extra credit, extra points yes. for being retrograde. Yes. So you have to understand this properly. The retro, and many people think retrogrades are afflicted. It's not an affliction. The retrograde planet is passive. Okay. So if you're going to have Saturn in the first house causing restriction of confidence, it's better to have it retrograde. It's more passive. It won't hurt as much. Okay. If it's in the marriage house, it's better to have it retrograde. It won't hurt as much. On the other hand, if you have Jupiter in the first house, you don't want it retrograde. It's going to be oh, less. Okay. It's going to be good, but not as good. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if if Jupiter rules the sixth house, 
and there's four planets aspecting the sixth house and they're benefics and you think the person's going to be a doctor you have to think again okay because the ruler is retrograde it's more passive and so the person doesn't usually understand their talents of the retrograde planet ruling the house until their adulthood, which is 29 or 30, then they can decide that I want to be in medicine. I see. Okay. It's like that. If maybe the, I saw a chart today, it was very strong for real estate, but the ruler of the fourth house was retrograde. It becomes a choice. Okay. Now, if everything that I've said is true, how can a retrograde planet be more powerful? I will explain. I will explain. This is in the sutras. The retrograde planets are closer to the earth. If a planet is closer to the earth, you can imagine it's likely to have a more powerful effect. Yes, yes. So how does this work? The way this works is that if Venus is retrograde, the person, as they get older, they are going to start looking at life more and more through the context of love and relationships. If Jupiter is retrograde, they're going to, as life goes on, not, not, in, not in an early age, but as life goes on, they're gonna start processing everything through religious and philosophical eyes. Okay. Why, why? The reason why is this, when you're a baby, you're an infant, and then you're two years old, and three years old, and five years old, and eight years old. What you come to learn are the planets that are more activated and extroverted. So let's say that Jupiter is retrograde, and you're a little toddler, and you're growing up, and you learn about love, and you learn about mother, and you learn about career, and you learn about work, because Jupiter is passive, you do not learn about religion or philosophy until last. Okay. And then it's a shock. It's a shock. Yeah. I, didn't know, I didn't know there was this thing called religion. And because it comes, you know, after the, the everything else, it's shocking and it becomes more prominent. And then you spend your life looking for at everything through religion and philosophy. That's the way that's the way that works. But so on an internal level, on the internal level, it becomes more powerful and because it's more powerful on the internal, eventually it has a certain power in the outer world. That's how that works. Another another um uh another uh sutra is that a karaka can be just as influential as a, as a house. Now that's kind of, that's kind of, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, as a house. So that's kind of obvious with Venus. Like a person may have a good seventh house, they may have a good seventh house in the Navamsha. And you think everything is great, but Venus is in Virgo right next to Ketu. Or Venus has fallen in Virgo right next to Mars or Saturn. And you know there's trouble. So. You know, that's obvious. What is not so obvious sometimes is that the fifth house looks great, but Jupiter is devastated and it causes big problems with children. Or Jupiter or, or Jupiter is, the fifth house is bad. You think there's no children, but Jupiter is highly exalted and well aspected by a full moon and the person has children. The most bizarre Karaka experience I can tell you is in the book. I have a friend who is a, a, a musician and I had done his reading when he was, I think 30, 35, I was 20 years ago. And I said, look, you've got to do music. This, you've got to do it. I mean, you're a musician. It's what he wanted to do, but he was afraid because it's so hard to make a living. He becomes a musician. 15 or 20 years later, he actually starts a professional astrology profession and he's like 48 years old. Wow. And I'm thinking, where is this coming from? Yes. It's, it's not from the eighth house. 
It's not because of cat. Well, it is partly because of cat too. <laughs> um, um, in his horoscope, you couldn't see it from the eighth house. There were no tenth house, eighth house connections. The Karaka Saturn. Saturn is the main Karaka of career. Now, if you read books, they're going to tell you the Karakas for career are the Sun and Saturn and Jupiter. They list like four planets as Karakas for career. This is nonsense. It's just nonsense. You do have to look at the entire horoscope. You yeah. can't just look at the career. You got to look at the whole horoscope. That's probably why they're giving five Karakas. Yes. But the real Karaka for career is Saturn. So in his horoscope, Saturn is in the fifth house. It's right next to Ketu, oh. metaphysical in the same degree, metaphysical, astral, otherworldly. Yes. It's aspected to the degree from Mars and Cancer. So Mars is ruling the eighth house, aspecting Saturn within a degree, the eighth house ruler is aspecting Saturn within a degree and Saturn's with Ketu. The Karaka alone made him an astrologer. And believe me, it took me a while. I'm looking at the chart. I'm looking and looking. One thing that you have to understand about, about figuring things out with astrology is very, it's the most important thing I can tell you. It's, it's what this book is all about, is that you have to be patient and you have to be disciplined and you have to be really serious to find the information that you're looking for. Now, I've said this in many interviews, Albert Einstein said, the reason he could gain such insights in science and other people couldn't, he said was very simple. He said, I'm not uncomfortable with confusion. Okay. So when someone gets uncomfortable with confusion, they run to the teacher and ask for help. They run to somebody. Mm -hmm. No, you have to stay. So I'm thinking to myself, how did this guy become an astrologer? And I'm looking and I'm looking and I'm looking. And eventually, if you look hard enough, you will usually find. But you've got to be really willing to stay in the confusion. OK, now there is another sutra that talks about not everything is astrological and personal because of mass karma. So you will not find everything. So for example, a million people, I think in the United States have died of COVID. That is mass karma. Yes. It's unlikely that you're going to find death in their horoscopes when they died. You might, cause it's 1 million out of 350 million. But if you take World War II, you had, I don't know, 50 million people, 60 million people dying all within a period of three or four years. And most of them were between the age of 20 and 30. You are not going to find their deaths in that horoscope. And that is called mass karma. The karma of the country, the mass karma. So there's a lot of things that you will not find in a horoscope. And some of it could be, I, I lost my job. Well, they lost their job because the company went under. Yes. So it's mass karma, you know? Okay. So, yeah, so there's, there's, there's things like that. Uh, there, there's so much that you learn over a period of time. I, I always talk about uh, when I was in Western astrology in the late 1970s, there was this astrologer named Isabel Hickey she wrote the best astrology book on Western astrologer, uh, Western astrology, one of the one one of the top three books on that subject. And I found it when I was studying in 1979. And I said, oh, this is fantastic. All I have to do, because she wrote the book when she was set, set 70 or 72. She'd spent a life in astrology. There was so much wisdom in that book. And I said, all I have to do is to memorize this book. But <laughs> you, is very difficult. You have to read yes. it over and over. And this happens with my book. I've had my proofreaders, you know, they, they say, oh my God, I love this book. And I've, I've, I've read it five times now because you can't, it's hard to process it all every time you read it. But there's an interesting thing also in that because the book is 216 sutras, I wrote it really 
I didn't write it in order, but when the 216 were done, I put them in order to be read in order. But people are saying, oh, I read one sutra a night. I open to the middle of the book and I read a sutra. And I say, <laughs> well, wait a minute. Are you going to read the whole thing through? But they have a lot of fun. But the, the interesting thing about that too is that it's more fun. And, you know, like one friend told me, he said, well, if I get to a sutra and it's too technical and I'm not in the mood for something technical, I just move to another sutra, you know? Mm. It just depends. It depends what you're... Uh, let's see, what, what else can I... I have 216 sutras here to, <laughs> to, pick, <laughs> to pick from. Um, so one of the sutras is about notice the difference in the horoscope Notice the difference between who a person is and what they do. Okay. So a person might have the moon in the first house. And the person may have a benefic in the sixth house. And so they like to take care of people. A person with the moon in the first house or the ascendant rulers right next to the moon, they're very nurturing and caring. That's who they are. That's who they are. Um, but the career may be very specific. The, the career may be Mars and Saturn in the 10th, and yeah. the career is very specific about mechanical, technical, or building. Yes. So there's a difference. So the reason I'm telling you to note the difference is because when you're doing a horoscope the, and you're telling the person the foundation, whether they're confident and life is easy, or they're not confident and life is a struggle. It's very fundamental. Also, what is very fundamental is who a person is. So this person may be mechanical, technical, and yet everybody in the office, when they have problems, may run to this person and say, I have a problem. Okay. You see what I mean? And so that's who the person is. So in the book, I was talking about my teacher, Santanam, and Santanam was, I explained that what he did, what he, I mean, I'm, I have his photograph here, I, I think, just give me one second. Uh, yeah, this is Santanam. That was my teacher in 1982, Santanam. Mm. Wow. And I was explaining that what he did was astrology. I met him, I was 31, 32. He couldn't have been more than 40. He had already translated seven or eight major classical texts, Parashara, Horasara, Horasara, Saravali, uh, he had, uh, at the age of 40. But it wasn't just what he did. It's also who he was. There's a difference. So it might be that somebody is an artist, but they can't make a living that way. So who they are is an artist, which means everything they do is going to be done artistically. But the career is mathematics or whatever whatever. So it's important to, to note the difference in, in who a person is versus what they do. And the best example I have about who, who Santanam was, why he was an, who he was was an astrologer, was because when I was saying my goodbyes to him in 1980, it was 1983, January, February, something like that. Um, and I asked him, I said, is there anything you want? And I wasn't rich. I was 31. I had no money. But I said, is there anything you want from America? And I held my breath because I thought he's going to say a computer. Computers were just starting in, in the early 80s. I, I was thinking he's going to say a computer or a watch or something that costs money. You know what he asked for? He said, I have been searching for years for a book by Al Biruni called The Elements of Astrology. It's an Arab astrology book. And that's what he wanted. And I found it. It took me three or four years. <laughs> I finally found it. Okay. But that's who, that's who he, so that's an important thing because, you know, when I talk about finding the theme of a horoscope, that is critical. The theme can be anything. The theme can be you have troubles in relationships, but you have to do this over here. I mean, it, it, it's, it's just, it's whatever you see in the horoscope, but you've got to be able to picture the horoscope as a whole and find out what the theme is. Um, so, you know, that, 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 that sort of thing is, is just, it's just critical. 
because if you find the theme of the horoscope, then the and and the person knows that you know who they are, who they are, as well as what they do, they are gonna they're gonna walk away having had a profound experience. Ninety percent of horoscopes, I would guess, the person walks away having gotten a bunch of pieces of information with no context, with no context. The context is gonna come from the theme of the chart, which is going to have to do with who they are and what they do and what their karma is. It's everything. And this is something I state in the book. You've gotta, from the very beginning of practicing astrology, you have to be looking at the theme from the start. It can't be, I'm going to get little pieces and then years from now, I'm going to get the theme. It doesn't work that way. And people say, well, how am I going to do this? And the, the example that I give, you do it the same way that you learn how to drive a car. Wow. Driving a car is not easy. When you drive a car, you have to have your hands on the wheel. Yeah. You have to be able to look here. You have to be looking in the mirror. You have to have your foot on the gas your foot on the, there's all these different things that you're doing, right? But you have one goal in mind. The main goal is what gets you to drive the car. The goal is I have to be able to navigate driving this car. And then there's all these little things that you do. With astrology, you have to be looking at the horoscope saying, I have to look at this horoscope to see the person's life as a whole and yes. the theme not just, will they have a good marriage? Will they have a good career? Not that. Yes. Will, very few people have had a profound astrological reading for that reason. Okay. When the horoscope falls flat, I have a whole section on clients, the clients. And one of the sutras is about when you know that the horoscope is accurate, because you could see the career fits, the money fits, this fits. But you notice that the person has not achieved anything, and yet the horoscope indicates that they should be having good accomplishment, right? Now, you only do this if you know that the chart is accurate. You see the chart is accurate. But they have not achieved anything. First of all, you look to see, is Saturn devastating the horoscope. If Saturn's right on the ascendant, right on the sun, right on the moon, or right on the ascendant ruler within a couple of degrees, that alone can destroy their confidence and it can ruin the chart. Secondly, if that is not the case, and you cannot, you're looking at the chart and you cannot figure out why they haven't achieved what they should achieve. You stop the reading and you say, what happened in childhood? Oh. They go, what? They go, what? You say, what happened? You don't even have to say in childhood. You just say, what happened? And they go, what? And you say, what happened? Something happened such that you're not accomplishing this. And then you're going to find out they got, they got raped. They got assaulted. They had some terrible failure. Something is likely to come up. Now, there's another piece of information that is very valuable. I don't know if it's in this book or not, but I put it in when I, in 2020, I updated my first book, my first book, Ancient Hindu Astrology for the Modern Western Astrologer. I updated that. I added 200 pages to it in the year 2020. And one of the things that I had come to find out, I, I knew from the start that the eighth house represents a sexy appearance. That was obvious. That's just one of the classical, the eighth house gives a person a lot of energy. If the eighth house is strong, Jupiter, Venus in the eighth house and moon in the eighth, it, it gives a lot of energy, longevity, and it gives, it gives a sexy appearance. The stronger the eighth house is, the more likely the possibility of being sexually assaulted. Okay. So if a child, so if I, if I am doing a reading for a parent and I see Jupiter, Venus in the eighth, yeah, uh, you know, moon, Venus in the eighth, anything that's going to make a strong eighth house with longevity and sexy appearance. Yeah. The other day I was doing a reading 
and I saw this eighth house that was just magnificent. And you see a lot of this because people that have good eighth houses, they come for astrology readings. And I said, was there a sexual assault? And they said, yes. And I suspect it was, she didn't give me the details, but I suspect it was pretty ongoing because the eighth house was that extreme. Another one, another one of the sutras is about Saturn. When you see Saturn in a house, you know there's gonna be problems unless there's really extenuating circumstances, there's gonna be some significant problems in the house that holds Saturn. But you need to understand why. Saturn represents scarcity and fear. So if a person has no money, they, they come from a position of scarcity. Oh, yes, I'll take whatever you pay me. Oh, okay. Instead of saying I deserve a lot, they go, oh, whatever you put. Uh, yeah. Saturn's in the seventh, Saturn's in the seventh house. They don't feel like they can get a great partner. So they'll, oh, I'll compromise and go with this person that's no good for me. Okay. Scarcity, wherever Saturn is, scarcity mm -hmm. in their attitude. It's not, it's not just that they're gonna have scarcity in that area, it's that you want to explain to them stop approaching relationships from a position of scarcity yeah. begin to think about abundance and fear if saturn is in the fifth house people may be scared of their children scared that if they say something wrong the child's going to have a problem a child has saturn in the ninth or tenth house the child may be scared of the parent oh, fear yeah. fear and scarcity another sutra is about it may seem like I'm giving you the whole book, but there's 216 of these. <laughs> and not only that, but I go into detail in all of them. One of the sutras, the internet is the best. The internet is the worst. The internet is giving people all kinds of information and it's giving them all kinds of falsehoods. Yes. And this is very unfortunate. And there is a place in the book where I start to talk about one of the pieces of garbage that the internet is astrologically is promoting. So here's one. Uh, if there's a fallen planet, seven houses. So in Chandra Lagna, moon ascendant. Yeah. I have not found the moon ascendant to be very important for me. I have enough material with the natal chart, the Navamsha, and the bhava chart you must use the bhava chart yes i spent i spent five six pages on the bhava chart in this book the bhava chart is about if you have a two degree ascendant and a planet's in 28 degrees yes it's going to be in two it's going to be in two houses the house it's in and the next one um but if there's a planet that is fallen seven houses away from the moon actually well what that's going to do is that's going to mean that the partner, it's like having a planet in the marriage house because it's seven houses away from the moon. Yeah. If it's fall, if it's fallen, there's going to be a big, it's not just that, it's not just that marriage is bad. In the early days, I said, oh, there's going to be a marriage problem. But as I went on, I saw the fallen planet, seven houses from the moon, or in the seventh house, fallen means there is something wrong with the partner. Okay. There is some personality problem if it's fallen mars seven houses from the moon or fallen mars in cancer in the seventh the partner's going to have a problem with anger if it's mercury and oh, if it's mercury in pisces in the seventh the person's going to be a little crazy if it's mercury in pisces seven houses away from the moon the person the partner's going to be a little crazy mm -hmm. so that's that's the way that that that, that works um, but i have found that chandra lagna works better for me when it's the seventh house from the moon. I, I have a speculation. I have a speculation that the ancient astrologers saw when, when you see any planet seven houses away from the moon, if Jupiter is seven houses away from the moon, it's like having Jupiter in the seventh house. The yeah. partner's spiritual, ethical, and moral. If Venus is seven houses from the moon, the partner's an artist, romantic. If Mercury is seven houses away from the moon, the person is intellectual, men the partner is intellectual, mental, and fickle. Okay. That's, 
If Mars is seven houses away from the moon, the partner is aggressive and assertive. It works perfectly. But the other planets in relation to the moon, I don't find that so, so great. I speculate that the ancient astrologers saw how well it worked opposite the moon. And they said, let's use the moon as a whole horoscope and all the planets. That's just my, my belief, my experience. I, I, I always go by my experience more than what other people tell me. Um, people that are very introspective and psychic, the ascendant ruler is near Ketu. Ketu is near the ascendant. Ketu is near the sun or the moon, really tight. They're going to be introspective and spiritual and metaphysical. However, they're also going to find life difficult. Okay. Because when you have Ketu on the ascendant, or Ketu with the sun or moon or the ascendant ruler, generally what you have is a person who has one foot in the world and one foot in the spiritual world. They're still, it's like they're still back in the spiritual world. Um, and I talk about people that have the moon conjunct Ketu. They are the most psychic of all. So if you go to a, a psychic fair, I don't know if you have them there. We have here a psychic fair sometimes, 10 psychics in the same room. And wow. you can go to different if you go around the room, most of those psychics, the, the, the one feature they're almost all going to have or, or a lot will have is the moon right next to Ketu. It's not a good ask. It's not a good conjunction. The person's mind is going back and forth and back and forth from the world to the astral world. Yeah. But it's very good for psychic work. Moon conjunct Ketu. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it seems the knowledge is like endless and so many sutras you have put together. Uh, one question I would like to ask you, if you permit. <laughs> So uh, the question is like, uh, when it comes to career, uh, generally they say that uh, if the Lagna Lord or the Ascendant Lord is related to the 10th house or the 10th Lord or Sun, Moon, for example, uh, sun, sun especially or Mars, then uh, it is said that whichever profession the person is in, uh, the person does good like 10th Lord in Lagna and 10th Lord, Lagna Lord anywhere. Uh, so have you, like, uh, what is your opinion? Look, 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 look. It's a connection. Yes. But it's one, it's probably one out of 10 or 15 different features. Yes. The problem with, you know, astrologers, they read some, some statement yeah. about one particular thing and they try to make it, it doesn't, they try to make it dominate everything. It doesn't. Yes. Yes. Everything that you just said is fine. But what if the 10th ruler is fallen in the worst degree of its fall? Whoa. Suddenly, all the other stuff goes out the So, you know, there's lots of different things that are, that are good and, and, and accurate, but you, you have to really, you have to really, you have to see the, the chart as a whole. But if your question is about the ruler of one and the ruler of 10, that's a career lifetime. That's a career lifetime. Career lifetime. So does it mean yeah, that will never retire? What? The, does it mean like the person will always be working and never no, retire? No, 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 no. It means, so some people, I look at a chart and I say, this is an, this is an artistic lifetime. Okay, this I is, see. This is a lifetime of money. Okay. This is a lifetime of career. Let's say that the ruler of one and 10 exchange signs. Yeah. There is no doubt. This is a career lifetime. Okay. Meaning, meaning career, you know, you have relationship, you have money, you have career, you have the arts. You have, if, 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 if the ruler of one and 10 are exchanging signs, that's yeah. very, very strong for a career. Okay. Some people, look, some people have the 10th ruler retrograde okay and i say to them you know you're going to have a career it'll probably be this kind of career but it's not going to be important okay. it probably it probably won't be if the person's ascendant ruler or the 10th ruler are retrograde they're not craving fame okay. they're not craving it they're not they'll have a career but it's not that important something okay. else may be more important okay 
and especially uh, when you time certain events like when somebody asks you uh, because most of the times the two prominent questions are you know when will i get a job or when will i get married most of the times you so, want to use transits okay more than i mean there are times when the dashas and buktis will be prominent but you want to use transits i have a sutra in the book about how to use transits when you use transits you have four positive elements with jupiter and four negative elements from saturn and that's what you yeah. use so okay. Let's say, like early on in my career, I saw that a woman had Jupiter transiting the fourth in a year. She was going to have Jupiter transiting the fourth house. At the same time, it would be aspecting the ruler of the fourth house. And Jupiter was also aspecting the fourth house from the moon and the ruler of the fourth house from the moon. Yeah. That's four positives. That's as much as you can have. Oh, with the okay. okay. Now, then you begin to look for Saturn. Okay. If Saturn has three or four negatives, yeah. then she won't get a house. Okay. In this case, in this case, Saturn was not aspecting the fourth house, was not okay. aspecting the ruler of the fourth, was not aspecting the fourth from the moon, and was not aspecting the ruler of the fourth house from the moon. I was only in astrology for a few years. I said, you're going to get a house. Wow. She says, there's no way I can get a house. I have no money for a house. I said, you're going to get a house. Because back then, I was very innocent and I was very naive. But I saw what I saw. And I said, you're going to get a house. No, I think you're going to get a house. She called me up and she said, I had a relative that died and left me. It was like an aunt or an uncle left her a house. Okay. So that's, so that is, you know, when I was in India, my, my first astrologer, uh, no, sorry, uh, my second astrologer, this was Padia in 1984. That's Padia. Yeah, you have so spoken about him before. And I... so Padia, I have a whole sutra about Padia. And, and Padi is still alive. He's in Bombay. So I was in a room. I, I, I went to India the second time uh, because my predictions, some of the predictions were going so wrong that I got frustrated. I said, I'm going back to India. I found Padi the first day in Bombay. I went to a famous astrologer. I called him up. I said, I practice Jyotish in America. He called all the local astrologers. There were eight astrologers in the room. I was, what, what is this? And after 10 minutes, Padia takes the horoscope. He says, let me see your horoscope. He says, you got married at 21 or 23. I couldn't believe it. I was married at 23. I said, but I didn't give you the Dasha Buktis. I just drew it by hand. How did you? He said, because I figured out the transits. And that's when I said, I want you to teach me. And that was funny. Yeah, I mean, that's incredible. So thank you so much, sir. Uh, it has been very enlightening uh, for, yes. uh, to hear from you. And thank you so much for the time that you have given. And I will pin the uh, details of the book and all other uh, details like yeah. your email and your website. You also do consultations. So please approach him for consultations. You will find all the details in the description section. And please share this video and uh, this book uh, with your astrology enthusiasts, friends. It, it's <laughs> very, very nice. I haven't seen you in three years. It's nice yes, yes, you. yes. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I wish you a good, uh, grand uh, success with the book. And I hope to see you back again soon. Thank you, Thank you sir.